All right, one note that on difficult terrain such as woods and basically anything in this game except for hills is difficult terrain, is that difficult terrain slows your movement by half. So basically you don't want your ranked up guys, ranked up guys are the guys using the movement trays, they're five wide or wider. You don't want these guys moving in a difficult terrain if you don't have to because their movement is cut in half. Okay, you can't march in difficult terrain, so you could theoretically, if a unit ends up in a decent sized forest, spending most of the game trying to get out of the forest. And uh, that's just huge. Okay, skirmishers, they can move through the woods at no minus. Now you can see one of the advantages of skirmishers. Skirmishers are lightly armed and armored, and they're good for going through that kind of stuff. Uh, flyers don't typically enter difficult terrain. Uh, they can't fly into difficult terrain. They can only mo use their land movement. And to find out what their land movement is, you have to actually look at your army book. Your army book will uh, show a number. That number is how far they move when using their ground movement, not their flying movement. If they don't fly 20, then they'll it'll tell you. All right. One last note is if your unit ever gets destroyed down to one guy, or it's a hero on foot then uh, at one guy or here on foot they have a 360 degree view so this guy could actually move this direction if he wanted uh, same with heroes that's uh, heroes are usually in units because this edition they can be shot at where they they had some they were safe in the previous edition, but they typically, but if a unit ever gets destroyed down to one guy or your hero is the only one left standing, then yes, they have a 360 degree view, similar to like the skirmishers do. All right, continuing on with the movement phase, uh, here's our source warriors lined up, ready. Ready again to charge attack, charge the high elves. Okay, in fantasy, unlike 40K, uh, when you charge someone, they don't have to take it. These guys have several options. The first option they have is they can flee, which means they voluntarily will retreat 2d6 away from the charging unit. Uh, you're thinking, well, what good does that do? Well, it, where there's multiple units and stuff, this could, because when these guys charge, they move their regular movement or half of their charge range forward. So what this can do is pull them out of their battle lines and then another unit from the high elves if it was here could charge them so that's called flee that's uh... it gets annoying because a lot of that's one thing a lot of 40k players have a problem with is is fleeing all the time it's like i just want to kill you i just want to get into combat but uh... fleeing is one of their um, options uh... hold if these guys didn't have bows say they were another fighting hand-to-hand -hand unit and they thought they could take them then or there, there was impassable terrain. If there was impassable terrain, you can't flee through that, so you'd be destroyed. You would hold, and therefore, when you hold, uh, you're going to, you know, get into close combat. And then your last option is stand and shoot. What these guys can do with a plus one penalty to hit is they can say, "Okay, well, you're going to charge me. Well, we're going to take a parting shot." And so you can inflict wounds. These guys can inflict wounds here before they uh, get into close combat. If they inflict 25%, then that's enough to make a panic test. So that's what a lot of archers will do is take that stand and shoot. Archers typically stink in close to close combat, which you would expect. But that is a main thing that is different in this game than in 40k because there is no fleeing from charges. Uh, this In fantasy, you can and, and it's huge. Uh, a lot of armies like uh, a lot of the elf armies, armies with five movements of five and six, love to do this because they'll, like I said earlier, they'll flee, and then another unit will be lined up to hit them in the flank. So uh, that's a pretty, pretty good tactic. All right, we're going to wrap up the movement phase here quickly. Um, we're going to talk about uh, charges a little bit more. What arc? Okay, here's the setup we have right now. It's the High Elves' turn, right here. You have a unit of High Elves, and you have the Phoenix Guard over here. Those are the White Lions. This right here is the Lizardmen. These guys have a charge range of 10, which, whoops. 
as you can see 10 inches well within charge range well within the charge range so okay the high elves would declare a charge the lizard men hold that's their charge reaction is this how you guys play this both of these guys move up and would hit you maximize models hold on my cats in the way all right if, the, if you said yes to this then that is the correct answer because they were both in the front arc so you would get the charge off and it would both be in the front arc. Here is a mistake that is commonly made. I have seen lots of players make this mistake. Go, because obviously, here's the Source Warriors front arc. They're both in the front. Here's the other one right here. So, so here's the mistake I see a lot of people go, oh, I declare charge with this guy. He hits them in the front. Cool. Well, now this guy... A lot of a lot of people, well not a lot, but I've seen this happen. Oh well since his front is occupied, I'm gonna hit him in the flank. But that's not the case because the white lions, this unit right here, started in the front arc. So if you said this was the correct arrangement or this is how the charge would be, both units to the front, maximizing models, then you are correct. Alright, the next charge we have. See the Phoenix Guards in the front, but also, now look, the White Lions are in the flank. See the red line? They are in the flank. So, if these guys were to charge, they would hit. That's the way the charge would work out. Now you're wondering, well, what's the big deal? Well, if you look at the combat uh, results chart. When you hit a unit in the flank, there's two things that happen. Number one, you take away his ranks. This a rank is five models. There's only five guys here, so there's not really a rank per se for him to take away. But you also get a plus one to combat. Like I was mentioning in uh, the start of this video, is maneuver is huge. You can take average troops and beat superior troops because of plus one here and then it would take away his ranks and if there were more than just five there would be ranks so these guys could be down by three four or five before any combat dice are rolled and that's what makes fantasy a more tactical game is because movement is such a uh, high importance all right if the source didn't want to take this uh, this charge then what they would do is declare a flea which basically you spin these guys around you would roll 2d6 because they have a movement of 6 or less. If it has a move of 7 or more, you roll 3d6. And these guys would move directly away from the unit with the larger unit strength. So they would move directly away from these guys. And if they didn't move away far enough, they remember their charge range is 10. If he didn't get if he's not more than 10 inches away, then they are run down and not one combat has been been uh, initiated. So that's a that's another difference between 40k and fantasy. All right, before we move on to the next parts of the video, which is going to be the magic phase, the shooting phase, and the close combat phase, I just want to let you know that your ballistic skill and melee skills uh, have the same importance in this game as they do in 40k. The the charts, the to hit chart, the to wound chart are identical. The only difference in this game versus 40k is there are modifiers to shooting such as long distance, someone being in cover, uh, whether it's soft cover, hard cover, uh, whether the shooting unit moves. So those are some differences again. Uh, next we're going to talk about the magic phase.